Welcome to lecture number 19 of my course on advanced mathematical physics in which we are studying differential geometry. In the last lecture, we talked about doing integration on manifolds. Now that is actually quite an advanced topic which we will discuss in some detail later on. For the time being, let me just point out to you how the one ingredient of the story that we already have in our kitty, the differential one form can be used as an integrand of line integrals. But before we do that, a quick recap of what these entities really are. Let me remind you that a covector is a linear map from TPM to R. That is, it's a map which acts on tangent vectors at the point B and carry them to real numbers. And the set of all covectors at a point P is denoted by Tp star m, and the union of all the Tp star m's over the entire manifold is a so called cotangent bundle T star m. Covector fields are entities which are really maps from the manifold m to T star m, and they are not just any maps from m to T star m. But they assign to a point P of the manifold a covector belonging to Tp star m. That is, a covector which is attached to the point P itself. And among such covector fields, the most important ones for our purpose are the smooth ones, the ones which are differentiable arbitrary number of times, and these are called differential one forms, or one forms for short. These are the one forms which supply integrands or line integrals, as we will now discuss. Just one small bit of recap more before we go on to our topic today. Line integrals are carried out over curves. So let me just remind you what a curve is in differential geometry. A curve is a map from an interval of the real line to the manifold. And for our present purpose, we consider an interval, a closed interval between A to B, and C is a map which carries this interval into M. Strictly speaking, C could have a domain which is bigger than this closed interval A, B. Typically, that would be the case. But we are interested in that part of C which maps the closed interval A, B to M. Now, Differential one forms, as we have been saying, are integrands for line integrals over a curve C. Now, given a curve C of this kind, a curve which maps a closed interval from A, B to the manifold M, the integral of a one form alpha over C is defined in the following manner. You denote it first of all by the integral of alpha over C. And the way you define it in terms of an ordinary Riemann integral is the following. You integrate this quantity, this integrand here. Alpha, remember, is a one form which means it maps the manifold to covectors. So at a point C of t, T is this parameter which goes from A to B and the curve C maps that region onto points of the manifold. At the point C of T, alpha has a particular value, so this is the covector. This covector acts on the tangent to the curve C at the point C of T, denoted by CT prime. This is the tangent to a curve with which we started our discussion on tangent vectors. This, of course, gives you a number at a particular value of t, or as t varies, this gives us a function of t. It is this function which you integrate with respect to t, and you integrate it from the limits a to the limit b. Now, one very important point is the following. A curve c is actually a map, not its image. However, what happens here is 
rather consistent with what we usually would consider an integral over some region. Here the value of integral of alpha over c depends only on the image of c and not on the actual map. So you can change the actual map as long as the points on the manifold that are traversed as you go from a to b are the same and you traverse them in the same direction, you get exactly the same value. So although we denote this as an integral over the curve C, what we really are integrating over is the image of the curve C. Of course, if we change the direction of traversal, the whole quantity is going to change sign. This is also pretty familiar from ordinary calculus on R. Let us now come to a very important special case. The case where the one form alpha is the differential of a function f. Then the integral of df over a curve c, according to our definition that we gave right now, is nothing but the value of df at ct acting on ct prime. This resulting function integrated with respect to t from a to b. But let me just remind you that the differential of a function at a point b is a covector which acting on a vector at the point p simply gives you a number given by vp acting on f. So according to that, this integrand here is nothing but ct prime acting on f. And that is what you have to integrate over t. Now, if you recall your definition of a tangent vector to a curve, this quantity ct prime acting on f is nothing but the rate at which the pulled back function c star f changes as t changes, ddg of c star f, and according to the standard theorem of integral calculus, the fundamental theorem, this thing integrates simply to c star f at b minus c star f at a. So the integral of the differential of a function f over a curve c is simply nothing but f at c of b minus f at c of a. The standard result that we expect from integral calculus also works for line integrals in the special case where what you are integrating is actually the differential of a function. Now, a very important special case of this special case happens when the curve that you are integrating over is a loop. That is, the image of the point B and the image of the point A, the two endpoints of the curve, are one and the same. Then what happens, of course, is C of B and C of E being the same, these two quantities exactly cancel each other out. And so if C is closed, then the integral of a differential of a function over a curve C is always going to give you zero. We typically write such an integral with a circle on the integral sign. But even if we don't do that, what we are claiming here is simply that if the curve is closed, an exact differential will always give you zero when you integrate that over this closed curve. Now just to illustrate an example of this, or rather you could say the opposite of this, just wait until you see the result. Let us consider a manifold M which is nothing but the plane but with the origin taken out. The reason why we have taken out the origin from the plane is simply that we want to talk about this particular one form x dy minus y dx divided by x square plus y square. This of course is defined everywhere except when you are at the origin the origin has been taken out so that this x square plus y square in the denominator does not vanish and cause any problems. What is immediate from this way of writing the thing is that the coordinates that we have used on this manifold are nothing but ordinary Cartesian coordinates. Let us now consider a curve from the interval 0 to 2 pi to m and c of t is given by simply cosine t comma sine t. That is x for the point 
c of t is cosine t and y coordinate for that is sine t. Now, it should be obvious that what we are talking about here is a curve whose image is a circle, the unit circle, which of course is a closed curve. Let us try integrating this differential one form alpha over this curve c of t. Now, according to our standard formula, this will simply become x dy minus y dx by x square plus y square, but we know that x and y take these values. So, if you plug that in, you are going to be able to rewrite everything in terms of t. So, x dy will simply become cos t into d of sin t, that is cos t dt, and so on. And it's a very simple calculation, and I'm pretty sure most of you have already done this before. This integrand simplifies to just dt, and you're integrating dt from 0 to pi. Obviously, the answer is 2 pi. What is striking here is that the answer is not 0. And so, our conclusion is x dy minus y dx by x square plus y square. This differential one form is not the differential of a function. But that in itself should not have come as much of a surprise. After all, differentials don't have to be differentials of a function. Differentials of a function are special. However, one very important point that you have to bear in mind is that our calculus courses long ago has taught us this. A differential m dx plus n dy is an exact differential if del m del y equals del m del x. For our particular example, m is x, sorry, m is minus y by x square plus y square and n is x by x square plus y square. You should be able to calculate these derivatives very easily and show that for this del m del y is exactly equal to del m del x. So the criterion that we use to decide whether a differential is exact or not is actually being met by this alpha. Despite that fact, this integral of alpha over c is actually not zero, despite the fact that the loop is a closed loop. And therefore, this alpha cannot be a differential of a function. Now, the subtle point that is very important here should really be much better known than it seems to be. So, let me just stress this one fact. m dx plus n dy is equal to d phi would imply that m is del phi del x and n is del phi del y. And therefore, del m del y equals del m del x would have to follow from the equality of mixed partial derivatives. So far, so good. But that really means that del m del y equals del m del x is a necessary condition for m dx plus n dy to be an exact differential. What this example reveals is that it is not a sufficient example in general. So although we take del m del y equal to del m del x to be a criterion for m dx plus n dy to be an exact differential, frankly that Criterion does not work everywhere. Actually, it does work if your manifold is, say, Rn. For example, if the manifold had been R2 and mdx plus ndy had satisfied del m del y equals del m del x, then this mdx plus ndy would have to be an exact differential. However, if the manifold is something else, then del m del y equals del m del x may not be a sufficient criterion for the differential to be exact. If it is not satisfied, the differential cannot be exact. It's a necessary condition, but it is not always sufficient. The fact that it is sufficient whenever m is Rn is actually a very important result called power Karel lemma. We will see later that del m del y equals del m del x essentially means that the exterior derivative of my differential form is zero. We haven't talked about exterior derivatives in general so far. We have only talked about differentials of a function. 
So that we'll have to wait until we get into differential forms on this course. But let me just give you a glimpse of what we are going to talk about later on. D of a differential being zero means that differential one form will be called a closed one form. If this one form is a differential of a function, then it's an exact one form. What we are seeing here is a reflection of the property that every exact differential form is closed because of a very special property of the D operator. If you apply D twice on a smooth function, you are going to get zero. However, depending on your manifold, closed forms may or may not be exact. And that leads to a very important topic of algebraic topology called cohomology. We will get around to cohomology later in this course, but that will only be after we have learned enough about differential geometry. And then, and someday I might be able to complete this part and go on to algebraic topology. Of course, our PH4105 course has both, but if you want to do it in detail, it's a rather long journey. At this stage, this is all I really have to talk about one forms. We will move on to tensors in the next lecture. Before we go there, I think a bit more detail about the idea about dual spaces and their connection to the original spaces may be useful. This is not differential geometry. This is just plain linear algebra. So if you have done a course in linear algebra and you know this stuff, please feel free to skip the rest of this video. If you haven't done such a course or if you are sketchy on the details, please pay attention to what is going to come because we are going to need that when we talk about tensors and other such entities. Before we go on to talk about tensors in the next lecture, let me take a quick detour through some familiar linear algebra. We have already talked about V star, the dual vector space of a given vector space, the space of all linear maps from V to the set of real numbers. But we want to explore this connection in a bit more detail because it's going to be useful for us, especially when we talk about tensors and tensor fields. Now, we have already proved in an earlier lecture that dimensionality wise V and V star are the same. They have the same dimension. Basically, what we showed was if you have a bunch of basis vectors E1 through En for V, then you can construct phi1 through phi n covectors or dual vectors with the property that phi i acting on Ej will be delta Ij. 1 if i and j are the same, 0 if i and j are different. And then we went on to show that phi1 through phi n actually forms a basis of V star. Now, as all real linear vector spaces with the same dimension are isomorphic, and here we have just shown that if you have an n element basis for V, you also can construct an n element basis for V star. V and V star have been shown to have the same dimension, so they are isomorphic. And that, of course, implies that there exists an isomorphism shy, a map between V to V star, which is both bijective, that is, one to one and onto, hence invertible, and is linearity preserving, that is, shy acting on AV plus BW, where V and W are vectors in capital V, and A and B are just real numbers, the same as a times shy V plus B times shy W. This works for all AB belonging to R, all real numbers, and all V comma W belonging to V, not V star. That's wrong here. Now, our proof that dim V is equal to dim V star can be easily extended to give an example of such an isomorphism. All we have to do is the following. If you have a basis v1 up through vn of v, in fact this is exactly what we called e1 through an a while ago, that induces a basis 
phi 1 through phi n on v star with this standard property phi i acting on vj is delta ij. Now our isomorphism shy should be able to tell me what any vector of v goes into that is the covector or dual vector that you get when you apply shy on any vector v. But since shy is a linear map it suffices to give us its value on the basis vectors because if you know the value which shy takes on the basis vectors since every vector in capital V is a combination of these basis vectors you know what shy gives where it acts on any vector and the particular thing that we are demanding here is that shy maps the vi the ith basis vector of capital V to phi i the corresponding ith basis vector in V star. Of course, this means that if V is any vector in capital V, Ci, Vi, here the summation over i is being implied, of course. Ci's are just real numbers. So this is just some linear combination of the basis vectors. Then under shy, what you have is Ci times shy Vi, of course, summed over i, or Ci phi i summed over i. Because shy vi are defined to be phi i. It is very easy to check that this map shy is a one to one onto map and that it preserves linearity. So it is a vector space isomorphism. So we are convinced that v and v star, v and its dual are isomorphic to each other and we have just constructed an isomorphism. There is only one problem with this which is that this isomorphism is what we would call an unnatural isomorphism. Although that word is really not used. We just say that the isomorphism is not natural. In other words, it's not something which depends on the basic structure of the vector space, but depends on the particular basis I have chosen. Just to show that this depends on the basis, let us tell, give you a very simple example. Another set of base vectors which would form a basis of V, again a basis of V and not of V star, is just the same set as before except that V1 has been replaced by V1 by 2. It is obvious that if the original set V1 through Vn was a basis of capital V, then V1 by 2 and V2, V3, Vn, all the other vector states are the same, is also a basis. Now, for this particular choice, the induced basis would be exactly the same as the induced basis which we had earlier, but instead of phi1, you would have to have 2 phi1. That's simply to ensure that this covector acting on the first basis vector v1 by 2 gives you 1. So our isomorphism, this new one, would map v1 by 2 to 2 phi 1. But the original isomorphism that we had, shy, which mapped v1, v2, vn to phi 1, phi 2, vn, would have mapped v1 by 2 to shy v1 by 2 which is half of shy v1 that's simply linearity and that means it would have given us phi1 by 2. Not 2 phi1. So the isomorphism that we have for this new basis choice of capital V is an equally good isomorphism between V and V star, but it depends on what particular basis we have chosen. So although we have proven that V star and V have the same dimension and hence they are isomorphic, and we have also constructed an isomorphism, this isomorphism is not natural, it is basis dependent. Now, let's ask ourselves another question. What about the dual of the dual of V? What about star of V star? Now, 
The space V star star by definition is a linear vector space of linear maps on V star. So you need to find objects which act linearly on these dual vectors and their collection would be the, your V star star. But we already have such objects. What we are demanding is F acting on V star and gives you real numbers. So acting on any combination A alpha plus B beta where alpha and beta are any two co-vectors and A and B are real numbers, you get A F alpha plus B F beta. Now it's obvious that the dimension of V star star has to be the same as the dimension of V star and so it has to be the same as the dimension of V. And therefore, since finite dimensional vector spaces with the same dimension are always isomorphic to each other, each of these three vector spaces are isomorphic to each other. In particular, V star star is isomorphic to V. However, there is a very, very natural isomorphism between V star star and V. An isomorphism which is much more natural than the isomorphism that we had constructed between V and V star. What we have to do is define f of v, an element of v star, star, for a v, an element of v. f of v acting on alpha would be defined simply as the result of alpha, the dual vector acting on v. Now, of course, alpha acting on v gives you a real number. So, f of v acting on alpha by this definition would also give you a real number. But this map which maps v to f of v gives us a natural isomorphism. It's obviously an isomorphism. The proof is trivial, so I'm not even going to talk about the proof in any detail. You should be able to work it out yourself. What is more important is that this map which maps V to F of V has been constructed without reference to any choice of basis. So it's obviously basis independent and hence a natural isomorphism. So, although a vector space V and its dual are isomorphic, the isomorphism is not natural, it's basis dependent. And so it's really not the same thing as saying that they are the same space. However, V star's dual, the dual of the dual of a vector space, is actually naturally isomorphic to the original vector space. All you are going to do is identify the vector V with the map f of v which acts on alpha to give you alpha of v. In fact, that identification can be done to such an extent that we usually do not bother to write it as f of v. We just denote it by v and say v acting on alpha is the same as alpha acting on v. Notice that alpha was originally defined to be a map which maps vectors to numbers. So alpha v is of course a real number. In the original definition, we did not have a notion of the vector acting on a covector, but you can easily define it this way so that the vector gets to act on a covector as well. And if it does that, the result works out like this. This is going to be very important later on when we talk about tensors because this idea about duals of a dual is the same as the original space will be something which is central to some of the manipulations we do there. Let me just finish today's lecture by giving you a glimpse of what all this connection between a vector space and its dual and its dual has to do with what we have been talking about. But before that, just a warning. The fact that V star has the same dimension as V and therefore V star star and hence they are all isomorphic, is fine for a finite dimensional vector space. However, it is not necessarily true for infinite dimensional vector spaces. In fact, for the kind of Hilbert spaces that we use for simple one-dimensional quantum mechanics, this result actually breaks down. And that leads to some mathematical subtleties in the structure of quantum mechanics for even simple one-dimensional systems. Now, we are not going to go into those things here. This is, after all, not a lecture on quantum mechanics 
and its mathematical structure. I just wanted to point that out to you. So that later on, when you meet this situation in quantum mechanics, you would be able to sort of see why the space of bras and the space of kets, despite being duals to each other, are not really isomorphic. Now, let's come to differential geometry. Here we had this idea that Tp star m is a dual space to Tpm. The members of Tpm are what we call tangent vectors, the members of Tp star m are what we call covectors. And the isomorphism that we talked about there, this isomorphism, which maps the basis vectors vi to phi i, in this case would depend, would become del del xi at p, mapping to dxi at p. The tangent vector to the ith coordinate curve passing to the point p could be mapped the, to the differential of the ith coordinate function at the point p. Now, while this is a perfectly good isomorphism, it is not natural in the sense that if you change your coordinates, you would end up with an entirely different isomorphism. But the dual of Tp star m, Tp star m star is Tpm. This is an isomorphism. And there, this is the kind of thing that we are going to use quite often in lectures to come. The action of a vector at a point P on a covector at a point P will be defined to be the action of the covector on the vector. In particular, we will make use of this quite often. Del del xi at the point P acting on alpha P will be the same as alpha P acting on del del xi P. This one, of course, has a perfectly well-defined notion already. After all, covectors are meant to act on vectors, in particular basis vectors, to produce numbers. The left-hand side is being defined here. This may seem like a small thing to you now, but later on you will see that this simplifies a lot of the notation, as well as concepts, when we go and talk about more complicated scenarios. Scenarios involving things like tensors. But tensors are going to be the focus of our next lecture. And once again, you will see that rather than a bunch of components transforming in a rather complicated manner, tensors in differential geometry are defined rather naturally. And this transformation rule which faces use to define tensors follow almost smoothly from that definition. But all that will be covered in a later lecture. Bye for today.